made the disclaimer. I'm the other one, you bastard. Here's a scary fact about every franchise. Exclusivity overrides discernment of quality. You can have the worst designed toy on the planet and people will still buy it thanks to 50% novelty and 50% the fear of missing out. There are innumerous examples. For example, Prime Unicron, terrible toy but highly sought after. Botcon used to get away with this all the time, such as those awful Combiner Wars redeckers. And sure, I may be a hypocrite for pointing such things out because I did fall for examples such as Shattered Glass, Ratchet, and Prime Breakdown. From what I hear, Prime Breakdown isn't a great figure. But then you get examples such as Earthrise Elite One and Paradron Medic, and I'm sorry, I'm out. Like, I'm not touching that sh so, to hopefully dissuade several of you from the recent Target and Amazon exclusives that everyone is scrambling to find stock from, I thought we'd take a look back at some of the weakest legends from the Prime Wars trilogy. Greetings Cybertronians, I'm Dr. Lockdown, and today's diagnosis pertains to the Takara Legends LG58 clone bot set, and LG61 Clone Tron set. Okay, so these sets are going to need a little bit of background, since the reason they're so sought after is somewhat complicated. In essence, these figures share the same robot design, but different alternate modes. Conceptually, this is really cool, but it does make selling them at general retail a little difficult. Thanks to the current size class restrictions, you can't just pack two of them into the same box at every store. Problem is, if you do them one at a time, kids just end up thinking they have that toy already. This kind of puts them at a disadvantage, since they are practically forced into their status as an exclusive. As such, Hasbro decides that they get packaged in with the five pack the Times Return gets. But hang on, that means you have to purchase eight other bots that you don't want just to get a couple of Legends figures. And didn't the rest of the sets get cancelled? Where are the others? Oh right, a Walmart exclusive two pack. Good luck importing that sh unless you live in Singapore or Malaysia because apparently they arrived at general retail along with Brainstorm lucky bastards. Then Takara releases their versions for the Takara Legends line and in this case there's no confusion with the name because they actually are Legends figures. I suppose they are Legends Legends. Yes, it's a stupid joke moving on. Thing is, people didn't bother getting these. Most preferred to skip them entirely and would rather hunt down the hard to find American versions for reasons. Never found out why to be honest, but it's probably something to do with G1 accuracy. So finally Hasbro's like, fine, you can have them. Target gets the cons and Amazon gets the bots. Happy? Honestly, people really weren't since Target America has a no freight forwarder policy that means importing from them is f***ed. Also, I think the customer service is racist as they told me, and I quote, they don't serve foreigners. So even amongst the ongoing issues pertaining to exclusive figure accessibility, the clones are especially difficult to come by. So indulge me today while I tell you why you shouldn't even bother in the first place, unless you're a psychopath completionist like myself. I suppose we should start off with the Autobot clones, since within the Takara Legends line they released first. Here we have Fast Lane, who in the West was renamed to Fast Clash for copyright reasons, but who shouldn't be confused with the upcoming Fast Track figure in the Earthrise line. Well, I suppose by the time this figure goes up it'll be out, but at the time of writing this script I sure as haven't seen him. Either way, Fast Lane transforms into... Uh, I'm gonna say a kid trying to fold down and do the nae at the same time. Yes, I'm fully aware that this is supposed to be a race car, even putting aside the knowledge I've accumulated from spending six plus years in the fandom. It's pretty easy to make out the general shape, and the spoiler does help, if only slightly. But even knowing what it's supposed to be, it doesn't do a very good job of it, let alone a good job of being an alternate mode altogether. Looks-wise, it's not really great. They've made no attempts to cover up the legs or arms, hence the kid doing a cringe-worthy dance comparison. You compare this to any other Legends figure from the Titans Return line, Yes, even the shitty ones in their worst modes. And you'll quickly notice one key theme. They don't look like they've got random ass robot mode parts sitting there. This guy looks like he's barely transformed, even if in actuality he does so to roughly the same extent as any of his line mates. It's not the engineering that causes the problems with the presentation, it's the laziness and the tooling. They designed the robot mode, had to curl up into a ball, and then went to the pub to drown their sorrows after being forced to work on the shit show that was the last night toy line. Unfinished is the most apt word in describing such an alt mode, to the point where I don't think any other Hasbro Legends figure comes close to how unfinished it is. This unfinishedness doubles down when you get to the solidity though. Or, well, can you get to the solidity? There really isn't any. Aside from the legs tapping it together, nothing locks in at all. Not the arms, not the hips, not even the spoiler. Also, it's on a 5mm peg so it comes off for some reason. Okay, I guess. There are very few Transformers that I own that are less solid than Fast Lane. And the others for that matter. The legs? Sure, fine, whatever. At the budget, so be it. But the arms? Come on, couldn't they have added tabs? This is pathetic, ridiculously so. Cloud Raker thankfully fares a little bit better, but not by much. In both solidity and aesthetics, he's at least a half step up. At least he has a main point of interest to draw your attention away from any potential flaws, that being the nose cone. Much like many of the Titans Return figures, the sculpt work is lovely. Unfortunately, it's surrounded by the ridiculous chunk of the hip joints. I understand that at this size it's very difficult to engineer things this way, but this is just excessive. Fortunately, the legs behind them actually peg in for once, actually giving this alt mode a generally more solid feel to it. The tabs aren't perfect, but they do get the job done. And yes, the wings are comically undersized, but given how they fold up into the legs, I think it's alright. Still, I wish they could have done something about the arms. Not 
only do they not tab into anything, but if they move slightly out of the side, they take the leg tabs with them, meaning that the whole thing just falls apart. In theory, it's a really solid transformation, but in practice, it just doesn't work and the figure ends up being incredibly disappointing. Disappointing may be better than bloody terrible, but since these two come packaged together more than often, that's pretty much half the box set failed. But hey, at least he has landing gear. That makes him good, right? Right? Right! So let's take a look at the competition, shall we? On first glance, this set seems to be a massive improvement, and yes, in certain aspects, it certainly is. Take Wingspan, for example. Beautiful bird mode. Absolutely beautiful. I think what really separates this from the others is the absolutely gorgeous purple on the wings. This kind of purple remains synonymous with Decepticons, and it looks as luscious as it always has. The mechanical detail is also very well done, falling halfway between Feathers and Cybertronian seam lines. In fact, in general, Time's Return was remarkable in its use of mechanical detail. Whilst Siege perfected this design, the Prime Wars trilogy was where we started to see this element within mainline design. Flourish. Now, I would say Masterpiece could learn a thing or two, but let's face it, people want obsessive tune accuracy in that line, so it will sadly never be on the same level again. Now, granted, the wings are a bit bulky from the front, but the idea of turning legs into wings is a quite clever one. It's also far more clever than what the original G1 toy attempted to do. See, Hasbro, when you bring new ideas into the G1 aesthetic, good things happen. And sure, I can't call it original, as I seem to recall good friend Bite the Anagear referring to a Unicron trilogy toy that did something similar. I think it was Energon Dive Bomb, but either way, it works remarkably well. And also, I have to give a lot of credit to the overall shape. It's pretty cohesive for a figure of this size, at least coming from Haztax designers. And sure, it's a little blocky towards the back, but given the way it transforms, it's perfectly understandable. And to finish off the positives, it's the most solid out of all the four. The wings actually tab in for once, and sure, the arms don't, but given that that's how the feet work, it's pretty understandable. This in junction with the gorgeous colours easily make him the best of the clones. Unfortunately, there is one thing that's credibly concerning. Take a look at the robot feet. Already the paint itself is that chalky white that Takara seems dead set on using a lot of the time. It's meant to look premium, but it ends up creating the opposite effect. Reminds me a lot of Battle in Space Hot Rod, a deeply archaic classics figure made even worse with a cack colour scheme. Fortunately though, I only wanted the set for Cyclonus, and he was pretty much worth it. But the presentation of the paint isn't the main issue, you can pretty easily see what's wrong here. Now, I haven't been rough with these figures over the years. To be honest, they've spent most of their time in a stationary position in storage, and yet, even weeks after receiving these figures, they began to chip. Honestly, this is piss poor. Not just somewhat piss poor, substantially piss poor. Especially on a premium item that costs more than a general Hasbro retail release, I find this unacceptable. And the frustrating thing is, this wasn't an uncommon thing within the Takara Legends lineup. At least amongst the Times Return repaints, many figures exhibited this same sort of chipping. And if that wasn't bad enough, take a look at Pounce over here! What the actual f***? What is going on here? Out of all the Legends figures I own, this has to be one of the worst cases of paint chipping I've ever come across, and in this instance, it's incredibly stupid. The only reason this particular piece was coated in white was to match the Headmaster's anime. I get what they were trying to do, but I strongly disprove of it. You can be tune accurate whilst still making your figures durable in their paintwork. Siege did this marvellously, especially with Sideswipe. It's remarkable how well his matte red coat has held up to this day, and I've been way more rough with him. Here though, this shouldn't be a thing, and you want to hear the worst part? Let's take a look at the reissues we got this year. The the recently released Amazon Galactic Odyssey Autobot pack is at least similar to the Hasbro release from years prior, so there shouldn't be any paint issues. The Target Decepticon Villains pack though, it's a near identical re-release of the Takara version. This means that it's incredibly likely that the paint issues will return in full force here. I cannot say for certain, but I also can't say that I'd be surprised if this was the case. And it's not like Pounce has any special qualities to help him overcome these flaws. Not only is he the least solid of the bunch by virtue of his transformation, but he's also the most unsightly. Like as bad as the Autobots were, at least they tried to have a sense of flow. Pounce just doesn't. I get that Legend Scale Beast Formers are prohibitively difficult to engineer, but Time to Turn had plenty of great Beast Formers in the Deluxe Scale. No, not you! Come back when you don't have exploding hinges. And to go one year later, you can see that Hasbro was fully capable of pulling off much better sh**. The effort just isn't here. I'm sorry, this is just plain lazy. Like, sure, the back legs I can forgive, but was it not possible to give them better tooling for the front ones? These are an absolute joke. And sure, the G1 versions were also pretty stupid, but they redid Wingspan's wings, so why did they forego the redesign aspects here? Also, and this is more of a pet peeve, why do neither of the beast heads lock in? It's minor, but it's little things like this in combination with everything else that makes these alt modes a little bit sh**. The only possible one is Wingspan, and considering it's impossible to get in without at least one other clone packed in, it's just not worth it. The only other aspect of these figures I'll forgive is the articulation, because, let's face it, prior to Kingdom, beast articulation in general hasn't been great. Hell, for all we know, Kingdom articulation could be awful, and we just don't know it yet. At the time of writing, no one has Black Arachnia, Cheetor, or Megatron, aside from the usual leaker suspects, so it's anyone's game. If I had to nitpick any of the 
the element of the articulation, I could probably ask for a little bit more wing rotation on wingspan. The double hinge could hypothetically allow for more downward flap, but thanks to the tooling, you really can't. Not sure why they did that, but it's a little disappointing. Still perfectly understandable given the size. They're a smidge bigger than your average Legends figure of the time, which is probably due to the somewhat simpler engineering in comparison to their line mates. That simplicity ends up being the bane of their alt modes, but it does present the idea that these figures were supposed to at some point fit into the standard Legends budget. There aren't any extra bells and whistles here that would indicate they were designed outside the traditional release schedule. Just throwing a shot in the dark here, I reckon these were intended for a mainline release at some point, however due to the aforementioned issues with their similarities in design they were likely moved to the box sets late in production. If these had been designed for the box sets from the ground up, they would have seen much better engineering, but as it stands, a lot of sacrifices have been made. And what do those sacrifices lead to? Well, perfect robot modes, of course, or are they? Well, visually maybe, but there's an undertone of issues it'll present. But to get to it, we're gonna have to transform them first. Most of the issues with these figures, especially when it comes to the vehicle modes in the solidity department, can be attributed to the fact that these guys share parts. Autobots share parts between each other, Decepticons share parts between each other. There aren't shared parts across the whole thing because that would be ludicrous, but that element is there so that they can make the robot modes look identical, as the G1 versions did. Although you can have identical robot modes using completely retooled parts. I mean, look at Studio Series Starscream that's coming out. But it is what it is, and surprisingly these guys do have fairly unique transformations. The uniqueness of the transformations isn't the problem, it's the fact that they just aren't solid. But you know, what's done is done, so let's get these guys transformed. When it comes to Cloudraker, you fold the feet up like so, separate the legs, rotate the spoiler up, turn the head around 180 degrees, pull the arms out like so, fold the spoiler back, fold out the fists like so, and you're done. Not really much in terms of complexity. Again, the transformation itself isn't the problem, it's the fact that there are no locking tabs. And I just realized I called the other guy Cloudraker when this is Cloudraker, but whatever, I'm just gonna leave it as is. I don't want to spend too much time on these figures because they're kind of Untab the feet like so, fold out the arms, take the nose cone and use the double hinge to fold it up there, and no f locking mechanism, ugh. Use these leg hinges to move down like so. Feet fold out, much like the other guy. Wings fold in once and fold in twice. Very simple, but very effective. I really like this step. Bring the legs down, bring the arms down, fold out the fists, and rotate the head around. Very interesting transformation. It would have been amazing if the arms had locked into place. Ugh. I think the only transformation I can call quote-unquote good is wingspans, because as you know, locking tabs everywhere all works really well. Untab the legs from there. Use the same hinges we used on Cloud Raker, fold in the wings like so, orient the legs forward so you can keep the robot mode good. Much like Cloud Raker, these parts fold out, arms rotate into place, beast head folds down, head rotates around, and that's that's basically it. That's a pretty fun transformation. I mean, sure, I would have liked this to have folded up, but I'll take it, it's fine. Pouncers has a lot of great ideas, but they don't pay off, they just don't. The tail folds back onto that, onto painted plastic, so it's gonna chip the tab, oh god. Keeping the back legs out of the way, you do the same thing you did with the other guys, with the arms folding back. The legs actually fold into a nice cohesive backpack. That's pretty neat, but they could have been tooled better. Also, this part could have folded up into the backpack. Would have been a nice way to finish it off, but oh well. Beast legs fold into the thighs, and surprisingly, they don't limit articulation that much. The thighs swivel 180 degrees, and then same as wingspan, the beast head folds back and the head folds around. Ugh, not a very solid beast mode, and going into an okay robot mode. Ugh. So hypothetically, these guys could have formed amazing transformations if they just had some locking tabs. And I'm hoping Haztac comes back to these characters someday, because these are very good bases. And if given the deluxe treatment, these could be amazing figures. But as it is, it's just boring. Wait, 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 no, this is the porn I meme, no! From the get-go, it's obvious that neither the transformation nor the alternate modes were the priority of this set. It was always going to be the robot modes. To be fair, that's the whole point of these characters. Generic troop fillers with different alt modes. However, did such a decision pay off? If kinda? Look, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. The clone robot modes are pretty generic and boring designs, with not that many defining features to them. I can't fault them for being that, as fans of these quote-unquote characters will probably be frothing at the mouth from the level of hype. It's rather similar to the recent Earthrise Alicon release, boring as shit robot mode, but someone out there is going to love it. So long as these two are built well enough, they should at least be good stand-ins, right? Well, the Autobot clones are at least somewhat adequate. Their robot modes are, of course, identical, save for the chest symbol and a small amount of kibble at the back. Gotta give props to the designers for keeping it mostly clean. Except for this part, but we'll get back to that later. Have to keep it positive for now. Gotta keep it positive. Despite a fairly simplistic design, the chest maintains a nice level of detail. The Gundam-esque panel lines really managed to give this a realistic edge, despite Takara's insistence on adhering to the anime colour scheme. For context, during Combiner Wars and Titans Return, they had a tendency to, uh, misread the room when it came to the intent of the sculpted detail. Several areas would be deliberately left clean for the sake of anime accuracy, and it led to many an argument on which was the superior version. Not helped by the rampant QC issues on both sides at the time. Look, sorry to burst your bubble, 
trouble, but as far as Chug is concerned, it's all manufactured in the same factory. Quality control and build quality were going to remain exactly the same. But tangent aside, my point is that this is one of those cases where it actually works remarkably well. Or at least better than the Decepticon clones. Jeez, I'm finding it really hard to remain positive. Come on, Doc, it's not Wei Jiang Thunder Leader we're dealing with. Honestly, there aren't that many areas that feel lacking in the paint department. Maybe the kneecaps could use some, but the alternative is GOD F***ING DAMN IT! STOP GOING STRAIGHT INTO COMPLAINT MODE, YOU F***ING IDIOT! YOU'RE COMING OFF AS A WHINY MORON! Anyway, the only real thing I can complain about these guys is in relation to the handling of the kibble. In some areas, it's awesome, such as the calves on Cloudraker hiding the wings exceptionally well. Doubly so for a Legends figure. The wheels on Fastlane are also fine. I've seen people complain about them, but honestly, such reasoning to me sounds whiny. That said, on the topic of Fastlane, there had to be something else they could have done with the spoiler. It not only looks bad, but it also f***s with the posability, clashing with the wheels unless you rotate it upwards, which... Just, no. And no, it's not the size of the wheels that's the problem, it's definitely the spoiler. You can really tell no care was given to how this would turn out, especially since, as I mentioned earlier, it just pops off on a 5mm port. And yes, it is accurate to the original G1 figure, but that's no real excuse when the designers, especially at the time, were very much used to overhauling weird elements from the original toys in crazy and unique ways. There are plenty of things in G1 that are incredibly f***ing stupid. Should we give concession to them all? G1 had parts forming, does that make it okay on modern toys? G1 Mirage snapped in half at the waist, does that mean the new one should have that? G1 had racist stereotypes. Does that make it okay in modern media? Come on, if you're racist and you know it, clap your hands. What the f***, bro? And on the Cloud Raker side of things, I really wish the nose cone tabbed in. It's fine for now, but it's inevitable that these joints will get loose someday. And when that happens, there's going to be problems. I'd rather they ditched the landing gear in favour of this, especially given the size class, which kind of makes landing gear more of an option than a necessity. Stability over extra options is the way I'd prefer to do things, but oh well, we have what we have. So yeah, these guys are kind of middle of the road. There's a small amount of good and a small amount of bad, with ultimately a forgettable experience for those who aren't familiar with the character. Many will consider not knowing the character a blasphemous thing for a reviewer to do, but ultimately a toy should give you something to care about beyond just representing something that came before. A toy isn't good or bad because of its source material, it just is on its own merits. And coupled with the lackluster vehicle modes, yeah, I can't really recommend these, especially given the better figures in this size class on the market, and the inflated price you have to pay for these buggers. Ironically, the Decepticon clones have the opposite problems, memorable and enjoyable beast modes, but massively compromised robot modes. It's weird because despite having superior colours, I find the sculpt work pretty boring. Even though turquoise is one of my favourite colours to put on a transformer, I'm just not feeling anything oddly enough. Maybe it's because of the lacking sculpted detail that was actually pretty good on the Autobot clones. Or maybe it's the slightly off chest proportions that do a worse job of hiding the hinges. Whatever it is, something is off here. I do like the legs, but when you notice the aforementioned awful paint chipping, they quickly lose their luster. I love the helmet designs with their gladiator-inspired crests, but the face doesn't give me anything to work with. To me, it just feels like a nothing robot, and that would work well for an army building figure if they didn't cost an armor leg and a business on the aftermarket. I suppose I should give props to the insanely good kibble management, but at this point, I'm really stressed for the positives. It's not a bad looking robot mode, emphasis on the looking part, but unless you're a massive fan of the clones, there's just nothing here to keep you hooked. However, there is one flaw that makes it plunge into the sh** zone. Articulation is pretty solid for a Legends figure, not missing anything you'd normally expect from the size class. However, take a look at this combination. Notice anything particularly wrong? Bicep swivel, and a ball jointed elbow. On paper, this sounds great. More articulation is always better. In practice, though, these two joints cancel each other out. You try to move the ball joint outwards and it takes the bicep by mistake. Then the bicep swivel gets stuck inwards and the arm looks broken. Then it's backwards so the elbow doesn't work at all. F***ing frustrating is what it is. As far as I can gather, this is the only time I've heard of a case like this happening. All they had to do was implement a hinge, but apparently that wasn't possible. The end result ends up being stupidly similar to the joints Figma uses, and those ones are just as frustrating as these. Too many joints isn't a common issue, but it does exist amongst other action figure communities. See Reveltech for more information. It makes these two prohibitively difficult to pose, and that's taking into account the fact that it's a Legends figure. I'm not asking for much from a figure of this size, but functioning elbows and bicep swivels is the bare minimum. And it's not like these are particularly complex figures, so I doubt the budget would have been affected that much. And even then, these are exclusives that aren't sold in the regular retail lineup, so budget flexibility is something that can be taken into account. But maybe these were designed for mainline, and then transferred over to exclusive status by Hasbro's mandates. Even then, it's still a sh** joint system. When you combine this oversight with the god-awful paint shipping, you quickly lose faith in this figure. So in one corner we've got a set with some serious design and quality control issues, and in the other we have the fumbling antics that culminate in the Transformers equivalent of the fake anime characters make when they just aren't feeling it anymore. Honestly, neither of these figures are worth it, whether at the traditional Legends price tag, the exclusivity amount, or whatever scalpers think they can get away with these days. Anyway, articulation. Wait, I've already done that for the Decepticons. Ah well, the Autobots have pretty standard shit for the time. Given the design, there's nothing particularly dynamic you can get them into, but it's not the kind of toy where such a thing is the main focus. The main focus here is to have a representation of 
of a somewhat boring character to begin with, so of course the articulation isn't going to blow you away. And size-wise, these guys are actually a smidge bigger than your average Legends figure, as said before. They're pretty wide for the hypothetical size class they'd fit into, not sure why they bothered, they should have just kept the size down and worked in better engineering, but ultimately that wasn't the point with these. The point was never to wow fans with engineering or design, it was to fill in a gap. On a personal level, I dislike figures like these. Outside of character recognition, nothing gets you excited. They're bad, but they aren't bad enough to be particularly memorable, so I end up leaving them in storage most of the time. And outside of that, well, there's nothing crazy engineering-wise. One set has disappointing vehicle modes, the other has structural issues and paint chipping. What is there really to say aside from, save your money for something else? The only people I can recommend these characters to are those who are absolutely in love with the clones as characters. Well, but do they even have characters? I don't know. And absolutely cannot convince themselves to wait for a later version from Hasbro. Because let's face it, if it's G1, Hasbro will give these another shot. Especially given scalping prices these days, these are a massive waste of money. And in all honesty, they're outclassed by the guns you get from non-F productions. Yes, if you're somehow unfortunate enough to have these, like I am, then I highly recommend looking into getting the non-F production weapon set. They are simple, but very effective, and go a long way to giving these guys way more character than they had. Still, the kit doesn't make it completely worth it to get these on their own. Just, if you haven't gotten them, just skip them. They're not the worst toys in the world, but they're definitely bad enough to make me confused over the hype with the re-releases. But that's the Transformers community in a nutshell. They complain and complain about exclusivity, but they'll end up buying every single one of them. Anyway, for those watching this review out of context, this is part of the third season of the Legendary Marathon, a show where over the course of December, I do 25 reviews on small-scale figures, 20 shorter reviews, and 5 full reviews like the one you are seeing right now. As such, we're back with a mini-review tomorrow, tackling a figure that's got a lot of hate when it first first came out, but is it deserving of such? See you tomorrow.